Uh, I am delighted to um, kick off our post rock series, um, which there are two sessions, <laughs> um, for the, just for this weekend. And, um, uh, and it's going to be, it's been sort of put together and so it's being facilitated by Andy Forrest, who's the founder of Cultural Arts and Media, and you can read more about it on um, your program and actually on the fantastic uh, website, culturebot.org. Um, but Andy and I, and, and the, the festival sort of started our partnership, I think about four or five years ago, uh, really because, you know, as you know, you're, you're here at the festival. You know, there's a the, the great festival that's happening right now. January 7th to 18th, you should check it out. Um, but really, it was about having a conversation about not just seeing the work, but how the work is made, how the work is received, who is making it, how they're making it, the business of making it, how to translate it, you know, who's performing in it, like how do you, you know, all of these things. We thought that it would be just important to start that conversation going in the context of um, the shows and festival, the festivals and festivals and shows that's going on. Just to sort of sit down together and just have a conversation about why is it we do what we do and how we do what we do. So um, I'm just going to kick it off to, to Andy and thank you all and all for being here. So. Oh, we are also being streamed on howron.com. So um, if you don't want to be um, streamed, um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 yeah, actually, hi, I'm Andy. Thank you, Mayan. And I'm just yeah, for just a second. Um, I also want to thank May I want to thank Mayan and I want to thank Mark and Russell. And everybody. give a round of applause to Mayan. Uh, and I say this, so I'm one of it. So um, it's just culture bond wouldn't exist without Mark. He made it possible for me to start it when uh, I worked for him at PS122, and, and I'm ever grateful for that. Um, also, we did work together this year to put some writers sort of embedded into the festival, and you can read their writing on both CultureBot and the Under the Radar website, and it's just something we hope to continue is to, you know, this sort of like ongoing contextual material related to the festival. Um, I, I, I know this is super annoying, but I'm going to do it anyway. Why, why doesn't everyone come down? Down here. Because um, one, of the, one of the things we've been really trying to do over the past several years is sort of do formats that aren't quite as formal and stuffy as normal panel discussions. And this year we sort of have this wonderful talk show set, which I was hoping I could get to be the talk show host, but just come on down. Every year I get to do this because I get to just invite a lot of 
lot of people that I think are super awesome and I get to talk to them, so this is great. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the sort of, Megan and I were talking about this from a bunch of different perspectives. Um, but I'll start with um, um, this question of context, actually, which has arisen a lot for me in the past year or so of seeing different work. And, um, you know, I, and, and I'll just sort of, the work of the people assembled here, um, and then just sort of throw it open. You know, I think um, when Dan and I uh, worked with Kate on uh, Okada um, in Joy, <coughs> It was, it, you know, in the last the tortoise piece, you know, there is this, you know, it's it's very interesting because you it, you are have a close relationship with him and adhere very closely to his sort of aesthetic. I think so. I think there's this question of sort of like how you as 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 individual theater artists respond to his work and think about the way you're putting it on for English-speaking audiences in translation. That's one piece of the puzzle. Um, I, uh, I saw a little Jardine. Jardine. I really want to learn to speak Portuguese now. <laughs> um, and, I, you know, I, and, and I thought it was very interesting because I don't know that it was made necessarily with the idea of being in other places. And I'm quite curious to sort of think about how that process happened. I'm also very curious about, there seem to be little signs in there that, um, you know, like, like the Polish thing, like, is that random, or is it because I've actually had people say, oh, Polish and Portuguese have this thing, so <laughs> I'm very curious about that. Uh, Mariano, I've seen a couple of, three of your pieces, and also the video screen piece that, that pushed, so I know that you've thought quite a bit about work, not only making it at home, but how it will translate into the world, so I'm really curious about how that decision-making process happened. When you work, when you did um, the piece in Chromium, did you use local? No, mm -hmm. like tour the record, it's all the local people. Right, so you're literally remaking the work with the people in town. So I guess my, my maybe we can start here and we'll just go down and sort of like, you know, how does the idea of, oh, uh, do we, we should start with someone? Uh, we start here and go down. It's like, how, how does this idea of sort of like, for you, did, did Ojo even start um, at, as a local project, or a sp specifically for where you are, and then what was your, what did you think about as as you wanted as it started to go out into the world? Yeah, I'm a little shy to start, but okay. uh, the thing we took was made to was made to Sao Paulo. We didn't have the idea that we could travel, and it's a, it's a, from our plays, it's the one from our shows is the one who travels most. It's surprising because it's a very text-based piece, I think. And you have, in Portuguese, you have uh, a very clear connection with the sound of words. So sometimes what you see, I don't know who has seen, it, who has seen the show, but when, when we listen something here, you see something here and you listen something that's outside. So you you have a, a sound connection, a language, a, a text, the lines are connected. It uses up one, one square of the scene, one one piece of the scene are related to another one, so it's a very text basis. So it's very surprising that that we traveled a lot. So that's why we use three three subtitles, and the audience can see the three subtitles. And it's very difficult to translate because we the, the show is all based in the, the actors' memories and my memories. So we have real things that that's happening, very contextualized things about their lives, about Brazil. It's not about but not only about the history of their intimacy, but also the history of Brazil, because we have eight years in Brazilian history there. So you can see the, the time changing and what changes in Brazil too. So the popular references that are in the show, I don't know here, it doesn't make any sense sometimes, but it has a very strong connection with the, the collective memory in Brazil. And what I think that happens in other countries is that something that we didn't expect that, that would cause some, some kind of reaction are very different, connected with the collective memory of each, collective, collective memory of each country we are traveling to. For instance, we talk about the Second World War in a very brief moment, and we are a country that hasn't participated for any, of any war. We don't have this history. We are a, very, we are a country with no, almost 
we have a very weak relation with our memory bank. And that's one, one of the reasons that I, I was making the show the first time. Because I was wondering, I, was, I wanted to talk about memory, how we relate with memory. We have a very recent dictatorship in Brazil. Uh, we are not a dictator, dictatorship for 25 years now, at most, I think. And we don't talk about it, never. I think it's very different. We are very close to Argentina. And they talk a lot about their, their dictatorship period. And I think that's important because they must remember and they have to they have something to sow. And the way we deal with it is to forget it. We forget it and we cover and we pretend it's not happening. And now we are in a moment very right, to the right. We are walking to the right in Brazil in several aspects. So I think that's related also because we don't have this kind of memory. So when we travel to Europe, for instance, I was talking about here, but for Europe, they have this very, they are, in the, instead of us, they are attached to the memory, I think. And so they have this, this, this feeling of, the, of, of memory. So when we talked about this little joke we do about the Second World War there, it's very, it's huge for them. Because they see the whole history, the capital H history, in, in the lap of a, the father that's seen on the play, and the, they, could, they can connect in different ways. When we talk about the Polish, in, you talk about the Polish? Mm -hmm. Yes, when we talk about the Polish in, in Blades, because one actress, her mother is Polish. We had a, a lot of immigrants in Brazil, and we talk about this in the show somehow, and we talk about this, and it, it's just for that, we don't have this, this kind. But when we present it in Holland, for instance, they have a very xenophobic relation with Polish. So it was very strong to their Moshe, and never, everybody talked about this. Another thing, that's, another thing that's very different in Brazil is that we, we have one relation, one of the scenes, it's about a maid and her, the owner of the house. And that's a very common relation in Brazil, yet. We, don't, we have very maids that are raised together with the family, and are almost slavery, I can, I can tell. And that's not common in, in, in Europe anymore, or here, I think. It's very, it's, it, it, it creates a, a little disturbance to the audience, I think, to, to watch this. And what was their question? Sorry. No, I, mean, I, think, I, think you, I think you've answered it very well. You we were talking about some of the things that that are, especially because you say you built the work with your ensemble, and a lot of it comes from their memories and, and, that, and, and that. So it was really built in Brazil with Brazilian actors very specifically to sort of cultural, um, you know, symbols and references there and how it changes when it when it moves environment. I think uh, one of the things that really uh, well, I'd love to come back to at some point in the conversation if we have if we have time is this idea of memory and how memory I mean that was something that was very powerful in the piece. And I think um, raised a lot of questions, but I think it's something that we actually all the relationship between physical objects and stories. <laughs> And what memory means. I think all of us who are in the business of, for the art of making theater, are somehow engaged with memory and how memory sort of persists over time in related to physical objects or non-physical things. Um, so actually, on the on on the since you mentioned Mariano, since I know that we actually nobody get upset, but um, I know Mariano has to has to leave to go work on his show and. Leonardo will have to be work on his show, so we got. So I want to throw the ball over to you um, and tell us a little bit about you know your your you know uh, experience of making work in Argentina and bringing it out into the world. And, well, I have to apologize for my extremely poor English, but I'm so biased. Um, yeah, well, I started to produce. <laughs> I started to produce performances uh, around 2002 in Argentina. Which uh, it was uh, the moment of the, our worst economic crisis, um, and, and I had the impression. I mean, there was a lot of riots on the street, and I had the impression that what was going on in the street was far more interesting than what we were producing uh, on inside the theaters. So the first impulse was to go outside in the street and to produce some site-specific performances. 
not specifically related to the political or economical situation at the time, but somehow to place our fiction in the context of the reality and to see how much our fiction was transforming the reality and how much the reality was having an influence on, on our fiction. And I, I think that uh, since that experience, um, also my stage performances has taken this idea of uh, um, to see how much uh, the, the local context where the play is taking part has an influence on the story of the characters and how much their own histories are transforming the big history of, of the place. Um, thinking about cineastas, filmmakers, the, the play that we are uh, presenting here, um, I, remember, I remember that at the beginning um, I started the, the play making a series of interviews to real filmmakers in Argentina because I wanted to uh, learn a little bit about their, their own experience, their personal experience uh, by creating fiction. Uh, I was interested in to see how much of their personal experience was present or on the films and how much to produce that specific fiction was transforming their private life. Uh, so somehow I had the impression that it became uh, a sort of um, fictional portrait of a city not through the real life of, of their inhabitants, but more through the fictions that they produce in a certain time frame. Uh, so that means that there is a lot of uh, local references. Uh, I mean, besides the pieces, it's more focused on our universal relationship with fiction and how much we are all building fictions all the time and how much we all live our experiences according to the fiction that we have been consuming since the, since the beginning of our life. Uh, besides that, uh, it is uh, extremely focused in, in, in certain local aspects of uh, what does it mean to produce fiction in the Argentinian context. So it's always tricky for me while presenting the, the play abroad uh, what to keep and what not to keep. So you change it depending? I don't change anything, but that was the answer. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, it was, it, it was mainly a discussion with myself if, if I had to you know, change something or make an adaptation. Um, and then I decided I, I won't. Uh, I, I will just present it as we did it in Buenos Aires. Uh, because besides, we have been touring quite often in the last probably five or seven years. And we are aware that our work might be also presented in an international context. We decided consciously. Consci not to think about that too much and to keep on producing basically for Buenos Aires and then, well, to see what happens when we contrast that uh, performance with a local uh, audience. And uh, of course there, there, there might be a lot of subtleties or uh, small cultural references that might get lost in translation, but I have the impression that still the, the, the main spirit is it's, it's, it's there. Um, it's fun while presenting the play here because I'm noticing how uh, much, how, how many um, American influence we have, of course, in our culture. And uh, there is a lot of references that here it has, uh, well, they have another meaning. Uh, we have a scene where Barack Obama appears uh, in the play, which, of course, in Buenos Aires it has certain meaning, and here it would be completely different. There is a lot of references to American filmmakers as well. Um, but um, yeah, the, the only experience that I had changing the, 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 the stories or changing um, the, the content of the work was with a site-specific performance that we did in the past, which was called La Marea, which was a site-specific performance that we did in a real street with 16 local actors and small scenes, which looks like ordinary life situations and, and people are like white years of someone else's life. Uh, so in that sense, we did uh, change a little bit the stories and the uh, historical references or the political backgrounds of certain characters. But just because the idea was to give the audience the feeling that they were um, spying or uh, uh, to, to the people of the city where they lived in. Uh, and also we were working with local actors, so it made more sense to, to, to change a little bit the stories. So, uh, uh, one sort of hybrid or like combinated question, combinated no, I uh, question for you, and then I actually want to tie that into what you did in Tony and in Target and other part of you. Um, when talking about the fiction transforming reality, for the first time, it really connected for me that the 
sort of the process of cineastas is actually, or that question as it's explored in cineastas is related to the piece that I saw in Bush. I can't remember the name of the public writing. Uh, it was called Sometimes I Think I Can See You. Sometimes I Think I Can See You. And it's a, it's a piece that um, Mariano created where um, you find local writers to sit in a public space with laptops and their writing is being projected in this public space and they are creating, they're not giving really, I don't know, can you talk? I just, it, there seems to be a linkage about sort of both in cineastas talking about the way the making of the fiction affects the personal life and affects real life. And it's a two-way conversation. And then um, similarly in Sometimes I Think I Can See You. See you. And the, and the sort of loop on that question, or the, the tail that question is, is um, because what you've done is, is sort of developed a, another strategy for engaging the same question in different places. So one is a fixed play that moves from place to place, and one is a, 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 a theatrical performative situation in public space. So I'm just sort of um, curious, do you see those as links? Or? Yeah, uh, it was not something that I planned in advance. But it's true that there is those concepts that they are coming back and forward in different formats. And with, with that uh, specific uh, place, uh, play that you mentioned, I was interested in this idea of to subtitle the reality. So the writers are basically working as a sort of uh, literary surveillance cameras in, in, in a specific place. And they are inventing stories about the people that they are watching and all the fictions that they are building. They are projecting, you know, live on the moment. So it's like, well, there is a lady in bed uh, waiting for the train. She's uh, thinking about killing herself or whatever. Right? Yeah. So uh, the, the interesting moment uh, for me, it was uh, when each person realized that there is somebody else writing her or his story there, <laughs> a possible story, not the real story, because it's what the writers imagined. And again, it's this idea of how much we can be transformed by fiction plays in public uh, context, uh, and also how much that real context is changing our fiction. Because uh, for the writers, it was this sort of godlike situation where they were free to write everything that they want of people, but on the other hand, they were completely forced to write just what they were watching on the moment. So they had to write about that person uh, waiting for the train. It was very, I mean, I have to say, like when I was sitting here having coffee and realized they were writing about me. <laughs> this is a very powerful, and I, 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 it really, I, I think, proposes some very interesting possibilities of, of how theater artists make theater happen. Like, they can explore, I don't think people always think about the fact that theater artists may be exploring similar ideas in different ways all the time and not making just plays that happen on stage and, that, that, and, and asking questions. And, and I just, I think it's really interesting. And, to that end, I want to ask Abby about you know 600 Highwaymen. You know, I know that um, this great country was made in Austin, pretty specifically. And then I feel like I don't know about the record, but I feel like that was kind of made specifically for here. So what was your, and you work a lot with sort of a mix of of trained performers and you know civilians. Um, how how is that sort of as you've sort of gone out into the world? How is that? Um. Um, so a lot of the choices I think have come, some have come from deliberate vision and some have come as accidental, um, uh, like Mariano was saying, is like you, things you don't plan in advance and the piece sort of takes on a, um, a biology of its own. Um, you know, the record, just as a little exposition, is a, is a project, we did it here last year at Under the Radar, um, and it's for a large group of performers. Um, around 40 or 50 people. Um, and we work with each of these people completely individually. It's a large choreographic dance piece and they perform it together and they don't meet in advance. Um, and we are now touring the work and none of the performers tour with the work. We cast locally wherever we are. So we just did it this summer in Holland and we'll be doing it this uh, coming year several places around the world. Um, so the end, and that, the thing that started that piece was not, oh, we're going to make the show where we go wherever and we're going to travel with it and we're going to do this thing. First of all, uh, that was like a company growth thing. Like we didn't 
have touring opportunities at that point when we came up with this idea. The thing that the seed that really started it was, can we make a show for a large body of people who don't meet beforehand? Um, and then once we were making the show, then we were then we were invited to do it here at Under the Radar, and then we made it a larger ensemble. And then when the opportunity came up to tour it, it was like a split second of like, well, how are we going to tour the show? I was going to meet on the plane, and then it was like, oh, right, no, we're not going to do that. Um, and and it it means that the 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 performance there then becomes a bit of a reflection of place. Um, the casting process. Uh, is a way of looking at the city that you're in. Um, so, you know, the New York cast looks very different from the Dutch cast, <laughs> shall we say. Um, and the French cast will also be very different. Um, and it means that, that the act of putting on the show and the barn raising of, of making a play um, becomes a very shared event. Um, uh, between Michael and myself, Michael's my husband and co-director of the company, and and the, the performers, but also then the performers and how they reflect their town back to their town. Um, Andy was referring to another piece of ours called This Great Country, which is um, an adaptation of Death and Salesman. Um, and we made it originally in Austin, Texas at the Peace Box Festival, and then uh, brought it up here to the River to River Festival, and in the process of doing that, um, didn't bring up the entire cast, we brought up a few people, and then we recast the rest of the show with New Yorkers. That, again, was like, that was budgetary. I mean, I think if someone had given us a million dollar check, we'd be like, where are you the Texans? We probably would have done that. Um, and that's sort of what I mean by a, a backdoor, like, crafting of a project that's that's more the, the, the logistics and the producing of it actually become a part of the artistic vision. Um, because then, you know, we, we built the show with a mix of Texans and New Yorkers and it turned into a whole other thing um, uh, because it became about place again. Um, it became about us being here in this moment, even if some of us are from Texas and some of us are from New York. Well, so two questions there. I, I would love to follow the, the spread, um, I don't know if Andrew's about how the production and budgetary and logistical choices affect what ends up in the, in the show, because that's a huge yeah. thing that people we'll talk about a lot. Yeah. Um, but also how, how you know, um, just a, if anyone's ever, Francis Ford Coppola made this movie called Apocalypse Now, <laughs> and there's a documentary so called... just talking about this the other day with Mark Yeoman. Hearts of yeah. Darkness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's this incredible documentary about his wife was filming and recording him during the process, and it's amazing to watch him basically like go insane and lose control of the production process, but keep fighting to go through. And then he somehow finds all the disasters and mistakes, documents everything, comes back to Hollywood and makes one of the greatest movies of all time. And there's something about being great artists, being able to sort of use the, the hardships and the mistakes and the disasters to create great work. But anyway, um, is there a conscious thought in your casting choices because I think that, like when, when we talk about cineastas and also Orjadim and the set construction and the way you structure that, you're sort of proposing we have to go somewhere. Okay, everybody? Yeah. Say bye to everybody. In a way, you're, you're, you're all sort of proposing to the audience that they actually look at things in a different way. Like you're not saying look at the story, go from the beginning to end. You know, you're showing it every, I don't want to give it away, but you're, you're asking people different questions. Mariano with his pieces are. And then I felt like with the record specifically, you were kind of saying, like, look at all the people, and we're making sort of like this cool, you know, sort of like moving tableau, tapestry of different types of people. So in a way, you're sort of, you're, you're also theatrically asking a very different question um, and inviting the audience to have very different relationship. So so is the casting then part of like how you think about constructing the Absolutely. Piece? We didn't actually finish making the, the, the choreographic score of the whole thing until we had cast everyone for the first time that we did it in New York. Um, when we did it the Invisible Dog, it was like we had some ideas of how it would look and then it was like we had to get at that point it was 35 people. And we got the 35 people and then it was like okay now we can make the score because I can picture like David has to come down here, and then Stuart should come down, 
and they should have this interaction, and then they should go away, and we should get these people together. And oh, it should be actually, we should have that person in, because that is more exciting to see them standing together than just those people. Um, so I guess there's like a surface element of like how you're looking at people, but our casting process is also about, I mean, Andy mentioned that we tend to work with um, diverse groups of people, so people with backgrounds that are in, uh, trained in theater and dance, but also not, um, or in other kinds of performance, or not, and putting these people together. Um, um, and I think that there, the record in particular um, has so much, because there's, there's no text in it, um, and the score of the piece and the material of the piece has a very sort of, uh, minimalist uh, hand to how it's constructed, it really is about the people who are performing it. And so a lot of it is about giving those people the proper container and then getting out of the way and letting the audience see them. And I think that the Death of Salesman project is different because that's actually, while it's, it, it, there's a similar, uh, it's a similar entry door. It's like still about these people who are doing this thing. There's another beast in the room, which is Arthur Miller's story. And so it's about actually getting out of the way, seeing these people, and seeing them like, have this thing for dinner. Yeah. So I want to do, um, uh, 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 moving from sort of the visual composition to text, um, um, that's a, you know, um, and I want to sort of propose now to Aya, Kate, and Dan um, some questions about working with Okada's text, and then with you guys actually working with Okada. Um, uh, Toshiki Okada is a very uh, well uh, esteemed Japanese playwright, one of the most important playwrights, I would say. I don't know. I, that's my bias, but I don't know. Um, and um, I don't know how much, so I'm, I'm curious, I don't know how much of a relationship you guys had like, with Happy and Joy. Was it just like a text that you then sort of started working on? And then how, so I'm curious, you know, like, because like, you were actually, when you actually went to work on um, your podcast, and you were actually collaborating as artists, so there's this sort of first layer, which is encountering through text, and then they're sort of moving into collaboration and how that works. Um, and yeah, and then I, and then if we can, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about that. If you guys could share. Um, well, we'll go for it. Um, I have um, so far translated um, something like a dozen of Toshiki Okada's plays, and um, I first encountered him because uh, I used to work at the Japan Society, and my boss Yoko wanted to really wanted to bring his company to the United States. Um, but he was like, what? My work would never be understood outside of Japan. Because he really wrote, um, he was like really putting up a mirror to his society. His work is very much about um, commenting on what's going on right now with a certain, you know, uh, like the landscape of Japan. Um, and he didn't even really think about how that might be interesting or even translatable to another uh, in, to another culture. Um, so, so Yoko at that point kind of put me on this project, and um, being a playwright myself, and also the same like age, the same generation as Toshiki, um, kind of really helped to ease that translation process because I, I, I have a relationship with you know my generation of people in this country as he does in his country, and I'm also familiar with what he's referring to in his plays. So you know the process of translating his work was more than just like a textual thing. It was really um, trying to find the way. The, the feeling that he, the feeling or the, the tone he was trying to achieve with his audience um, and finding a similar kind of parallel in speaking to the audiences here. Um, so I guess I translated about two of his plays when Kate um, <coughs> became interested in, in Joy. Um, and 
the play company commissioned me to translate it. <coughs> I, I, yeah, the, the way I learned about Okada was through tech and through Aya, actually. I can't read Japanese, and I had really never heard of Okada before I read I think it was like a page or 20 pages, maybe, of a translation that you had started as part of another process I won't go into. But I, I just read those 20 pages and said, we have to produce this. And then we finished Yes, yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and then we, so and then I translated it, and then we were like, well, who should direct it? <laughs> um, and the play company um, and I really kind of were looking for the right match, knowing how Toshiki works. Um, and he, you know, like most artists, most theater um, artists in Japan, they, they're like playwrights slash directors who have their own company and they write plays for their ensemble, etc. Um, not that we thought that it had to be that way, but maybe there was some kind of um, just resonance with, uh, you know, if we could find someone who had resonance with that, that might be a good match. And, um, but that, among other reasons, <coughs> we met with Dan and thought, maybe this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I guess then began what's now been a six-year journey for me, uh, working uh, on Toshiki's scripts, uh, Toshiki scripts and I's translation and Kate's productions, and then also eventually inviting Toshiki into my company, Pig Iron, to make work specifically for us. Um, I mean, the funny thing about that encounter is um, you said you think that our aesthetics are similar, and also you said no. they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> Because uh, I had first saw Okada's work through <coughs> Spotlight Japan when, at the Prelude Festival and then seeing seeing Five Days in March in Japanese at the Japan Society. And when I saw Enjoy, I thought you did a very you were very faithful to the the, the, the visual, the movement, because he has a sort of very specific movement vocabulary. This was my impression. Right, so my my intention was the opposite. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I, I'm not offended by that at all. I, mean, I, I think, um, I mean, there's so many things, so many ways that the uh, art form reaches the audience with Okada's work and the highest translation. Um, I mean, when I, so my theater company uh, was born as a theater company without text and focusing on image. Uh, and I had a rule to ban all narrators. Um, like, please let there be no narrators. And Kate gave me the script, which is 100% narration. Oh, right. <laughs> it's just narrators. And I was like, okay, well, I also like to do the wrong thing. So this is something's in here that's sort of exactly opposite, and it's so it is so great. Um, and uh, another thing happened, which was I sort of saw Toshiki does this really interesting formal move specifically in his writing, where someone will start quoting someone else, um, and then sort of do a, sarca not sarcastic, but impression of the other person, as though to say, so Andy asked me this question, and then Andy said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So that is like one state of, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and then this actor will continue doing the impression much longer than I just did of Andy, to the point where you're like, who's Andy again? Is it this body or this body? which really opens up so many possibilities in terms of staging and casting and really cultural translation. Um, so there was that aspect of the writing that really excited me. Then I did go to see Toshiki's work Five Days in March, which I met, and I thought is even more opposite to what I create. Uh, the original visual work that I had been creating was quite focused on clarity. And I found all of Toshiki's visual gesture to be opaque and beautiful. And unlike anything I'd seen before, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, probably most people in this room have seen a lot of different kinds of movements. So I was thinking, I think I've seen a lot of different kinds of movement at this point, and I really don't know what this is. And um, Kate sent Aya and me to Japan to meet with Toshiki and to watch him work with his 
uh, ensemble. And I very, I really, uh, he was extremely cagey. Uh, I call it, and I still call it, I call him cagey. He, in, in, in his autobiographical play that he wrote for us, he has another character describe him as a savant. <laughs> like, like an idiot savant who doesn't know what he's actually doing. <laughs> and um, certainly that's what I, I, I sort of can't believe it, but it's very, not very easy to get Toshiki to talk about the craft of what he does. So I remember saying, okay, five days in March, this play, nobody touches in your play. What's that about? Not a single person touches. And he said, oh, that's just because we're Japanese. <laughs> and I said, your play is about two people who spend five days in a love hotel in bed and two people who get swept up into a protest march. Mm -hmm. Normally, if someone were staging that, they would touch. He said, no, no, it doesn't matter. But they don't touch at all. So um, after that conversation, and which was my first meeting with Okada, I said, "I'm really. It's really important that I not attempt anything like Okada's movement style." Um, so uh, I guess I, I guess I wanted to sort of just talk a little bit about the strategies that I certainly discussed with these guys, of making sure to cast a multiracial. Um, cast of Americans, and you know, here's a small, that, that we would put in tons of cues to the audience that you know who we are, you know who we are, so that this would not be a piece that said that's how it is in Japan, but that in all kinds of ways we would cue the audience. So uh, certainly it's become more common in American newscasting to change your pronunciation when you speak a Spanish word. I remember back in the 80s or 90s, Jimmy Smith's on Saturday Night Live, that skit where they're like, hey, Bob Costas, and be a tornado. So that was already starting to be a joke then, and I think. Um, but I would say that, they're, you know, uh, liberal minded people, when they are expressing, here in, I'm talking about a Japanese person, will talk about Atsushi and add a little Japanese pronunciation that I would really train the American ensemble to say, say it American. Say the same way you say Tokyo, and you don't say Tokyo. Um, don't do that. So pronounce all the names that way, so that all of this stuff is being communicated to the audience that you know exactly who these people are. Um, but you chose to keep Japanese character names too. I did. I did. Yeah. Um, I guess I thought that that was a really good parallel with what Toshiki was doing with that formal move of quoting people that he was specifically interested in watching how description could float and, and vibrate against the body that's speaking. So it was sort of the perfect, I do think Joshiki's plays can really be done anywhere with all kinds of different performers because of that, because of this very particular movie. Um, I mean, I, I have lots to say about how, how it all went down when we invited Joshiki to come specifically to talk to us about that movement vocabulary, um, you know, sitting in, on this panel, I think of, I, I think I have to go back and do another Toshiki play this past year with Kate and I, which was a piece that he had made for Japan. And Toshiki made some very radical moves as a writer for that piece. He said, I'm going to write an autobiography. I'm going to write about myself because I think it's kind of funny to have Americans play me because I would be too embarrassed to do that. And also that he was going to speak about um, issues that were very hard to speak about in Japan. And I guess I feel like, um, it's taken me a couple of years, but I feel like that middle piece where I got to be so much closer to Toshiki himself, but I think I think of that piece as the least successful translation. Mm -hmm. And um, partially it's a question of place. I think partially Toshiki was mostly imagining American actors in Japan and how that would work. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we successfully in a way, that place that play takes place nowhere, mm -hmm. as opposed to having a script that takes place in Tokyo and a staging that takes place very strongly in New York. And um, there were things about that piece that have to do with context and politics that I, I don't think I succeeded in conveying to the American audience. Like I, Toshiki was doing, you know, so this was a a, a piece. There was he was writing it as it was happening. He, at, in the course of the commission and the collaboration. The Fukushima meltdown happened, 
and uh, the tsunami and the Fukushima meltdown that happened between workshop one and workshop two. You're talking about zero cost house? Zero cost house, so in the, in the course of this collaborative creation of Toshi. And then he turned it into an autobiography and documented, had our characters document how he, Toshiki, moved to the west of Japan. Mm -hmm. And um, it was only a year and a half, by the time we premiered the piece, maybe a year and a half. And he has the character playing himself say to his manager, um, I think we need to change the whole system. Uh, I'm moving out of Tokyo. You know, to be an artist, to move out of Tokyo, which is the population center of Japan and the cultural center of Japan, I think there was a lot of uh, feeling in Japan that that was uh, almost treasonous. Uh, you know, and, I, and the comparison I kept making was like, imagine that it's 2003, and a New Yorker says to another New Yorker, you know, it's good that 9/11 happened because the whole system that made New York is fucked and is going to uh, fall apart and tear us apart. And the more people who leave New York, the better. Mm -hmm. And just, but even, imagine the wound for a New Yorker or even an American that you're putting your finger in to, to say, and the character doesn't quite say it's good, but, but to say, in a way there's nothing, you couldn't hear anything, I think, as a New Yorker after, you know it's good that 9-11 happened. Right. Um, in 2003 in particular. Um, so the, to me, when, what would happen knowing the little that I knew about the Japanese political situation, that scene would, I would just like stop breathing watching this happen. And I just couldn't figure out how to make an American audience feel that. We eventually toured the piece to Japan and boy did it get quiet in that scene. But um, there were pieces, I feel like I would have had to stop the play and say what I just said. Right. And go, so just so you know. <laughs> trying to figure out the collaboration. I think right now sitting here, I wish I had done that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there were a lot of, one thing about that that particular collaboration, I mean my company Pigiron often brings in a wild card who will stretch what we understand mm -hmm. about everything, acting style and everything, but sometimes those people um, we miss each other because they're like, I'm going to write something that's really big and iron. And we're like, we want to do what you're interested yeah. in. And I think that piece may have landed in that. Um, no hands thing? Yeah. So I want to come back. You raised a lot of great stuff, but also to the, the thing that really kind of res one of the many things of what you said just resonated was this is who we are, and that idea of establishing trust at the beginning of the relationship between the audience and the show. And, I want, and I'm curious to come back and talk a little bit about more. And also the political piece. I want to because Erwin uh, spent a number of years in the cultural diplomacy field, still involved. And I want to come back to that piece. But before we do, because I know we're going to lose you soon, I want to. I, some of the things that came up when Dan was speaking uh, and talking was um, sort of, you know, learning from seeing how the work presents in different cultures and thinking about established and trust. And I'm just curious, I don't actually know, and I don't know, like, do you have a, like, how do you work? Do you have a company that you work with regularly? Do you work with playwrights? And then from your experience of seeing, like, um, uh, Mariana was talking about how, you know, the scene in this show where Barack Obama comes in, like, Barack Obama showing up in a Latin American country is much, reads much differently than it does here. And so I'm curious, are there things that you're, that you're learning from playing the show in other places that are going to inform what you do when you go back? No, 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 not big changes, but are there things that, like, so my first question is, how do you work? You have not some board players or so The second question is, are there things you're learning about the way, like you're saying, some things are so Brazil-centric and we don't, you know, are there things that you're learning about the way things read to other audiences? Oh, that's interesting. Maybe you could explore that. So we work, I work with a company. Uh, we have uh, an six actor with me since the beginning of the company. And every piece we create, every work we create together, we, we start our process. a very long process. <coughs> this piece, this, this, this show, we took 13 months to complete it. Because it's very biographical, it's very autobiographical. Each show is biographical, even the audience doesn't make sense. Can we escape fiction from fiction? Because I'm talking here 
in the slide, there is a very teachable context here. Uh, and I think that that's that's the part, that's what I what I think when we present the show in another place. What kinds of fiction this audience looks for, mm -hmm. and what fictions do they have in their memories, and that will say how they read the show and how they look at the show. The Garden is a very melodramatic show. I know it, it is, and it's on purpose that it's melodramatic because melodrama is the fiction we mostly consume in Brazil. We have the soap operas, we are very famous for our soap operas, and the soap operas travel the world and 90% uh, of the population watch the soap operas. And it's very, they are very melodramatic. So our reference to create and to watch shows and to assess our memory is melodrama. We, and a lot of American movies too, that's also melodramatic sometimes. And we, so that's why it shows melodramatic. So I think that we, when we present, I, I can feel different energies of the audience and I try to understand what kinds of fiction they, how they fictionalize their own lives. I don't know if that makes sense, mm -hmm. sense, but I don't think it's a, I think of course it's a question, it's a matter of, of the context, the political situation, the social situation, the economical situation of, the, of, the, of each country, the cultural background each one of, from, from each country. But I also think it's about the structural background where it's related to the fictions we consume and the fictions we create and, and how we understand fiction and how and the, the very simple fiction and how we say the, the greetings for for instance I'm very curious about the greetings in Brazil it's very with Dutch and we say ah we talk a lot of nothing the greeting takes almost three four minutes ah, I know and it's if, and if you write it. It's nothing. In fact, uh, here I think you have this very polite. It's a it's a for for me impression. It's not a prejudice. It's just an impression. You have this this very polite greeting, but very short greeting too. And we, you, uh, my my feeling is that you have always to agree with them, everyone. There is a lot of yeah yeah. <laughs> and how we are comfortable in this fictional situation. So I, I, I'm very curious about this and I want to, to put this in, in, in my work somehow. I think that changes the, how we write the best. You, I mean, it's interesting because at, at, at international, especially like this time of year, it's hard to remember how you're supposed to greet different people. <laughs> like the Dutch kiss three times, the French do twice. Some French you know, do four. Some French do four. And like and, and when you go to England you can't tell whether they're being mean to you or <laughs> actually nice or what's going on. And um you know, and so there's these really complicated layers of sort of our our expectations of behavior and greetings and and, and, and even if we are coming from the same place, often we're not necessarily led even if we're trying to be nice to each other, we're not always possible. Yes. Or we accidentally so I think this is really interesting, and, and, and so um, I'm curious to see what your next show is about fictions. Uh, we hope Mark, Mark, you're going to bring you back. Okay. And um, um, but so I want to turn that over on that idea of sort of like because you have spent a lot of time working with a lot of different people when yes. um, and you not live here but you're Dutch mm -hmm. and worked for the Dutch consulate and you worked for the Netherlands American Foundation now and you've spent a lot of time working with lots of different. Culture. So I'm sort of curious, as a, as a director, how do you think about the, 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 these issues? Well, I think the... Sorry. You have to go. All right. Everybody, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as a director myself, I, I think what is really interesting that has come up is this balance of how much do you keep on to, to the cultural reference and how much do you let go. So, for example, First, uh, my, one of my first pieces here that I, I had a mission to do, like this very uber Dutch, uber Dutch play in, in a city like New York. And the Netherlands, of course, is very small, and I had to think immediately about Alex Kwamelon, who's like a playwright, director, um, also a filmmaker. And if you look at his plays, it's 
It's really about how does the Netherlands is a man-made country almost, and because it's below sea level, so everything is square. There's a little house with a little plum of smoke out coming out of a cow in the meadow. Like that's typical, like this Dutchness, um, and that's how he writes. And to do that here with Dutch people, I don't know how that would translate. So I wanted to do that with American designers, American uh, actors, and very quickly. Um, what started to happen was I could hold on to it or start more working with them. What came out was almost this very low budget uh, Cirque du Soleil uh, uh, kind of feel of, of magic and, and, and imagery, uh, which was very interesting because what Alex Wangan works with a lot is the fairy tales of the Grimm, the Grimm fairy tales. So it was a completely different uh, look and feel than what I initially had in mind. Uh, but it actually kind of come, came almost closer to, to what he is trying to do. And I think um, also working with a lot of other companies, uh, for example, Ivo van Hoven with the people who works them, uh, this is something that I've always been very interested in, that if you translate works, it's always an adaptation, particularly when it comes to Shakespeare or Greek, uh, Greek plays. And for some reason, I feel if I see a Shakespeare in a foreign language, particularly also a language that I don't understand, and I've seen quite a lot of it, I almost get Shakespeare more. Uh, because it seems like the actors are not so, uh, how would I say, like, are not so, yeah, encumbered or stuck by the language. Uh, and, it, and also when I see some of the Dutch uh, translation, it seems like they go straight to the core of what he's trying to say. Now that's great to be in Holland and see that, but then what if you bring that piece back to an English country? And that's what has been happening, of course. And I thought, uh, like one of the last pieces uh, at Banff, for example, uh, which was of course a very American play, uh, The Angels in America, um, was quite interesting to hear feedback from people uh, reading the subtitles, because it was the best then. And it was, of course, a different language than the original play because it was the subtitles of the Dutch adaptation of the play. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of interesting uh, realms and hybridization, well, hybridization, uh, that I think is, uh, is actually really interesting and I think it's going to go even more into that direction. Uh, looking with younger makers right now, uh, I'm very intrigued by how the, the very the new generation is so not stuck by borders. I feel like even I'm not I don't consider myself that old, but I I didn't grow up with the internet, um, and I feel like what, even your question at the beginning or how this was say to like create locally, uh, think globally. Uh, I wonder how the new generation of creators is even thinking what lo local is. What is local? Because there is no order anymore. Well, I, I think it's a. I mean, the, I, I posed. The, I titled it that because I think that there is a local. This is local. Exactly. And I think, but but the, and what you're. I mean, it's really interesting. I wasn't here, unfortunately, for um, Angels in America, but I was here for uh, Roman Tragedies. Yes. Eva von Hova, if anybody's not familiar, is just this incredible <coughs> Dutch director, and he did all, he did uh, a piece of band called Roman Tragedies, where he put three of Shakespeare's Roman Tragedies and performed them back to back uh, over six hours at BAM, and, and it was general admission, and he could walk around all he wanted through the opera house. It was pretty extraordinary. But I was thinking about that, when you were saying that, that translation, because it was a translate, the, the super titles were a translation of the Dutch sort of like loose translation of Shakespeare. Adaptation. And adaptation of it. So it really created this um, interesting space. And then I was, and then um, you also sort of brought to mind uh, Jus Plumgren. Uh, Jus Plumgren is, uh, that's me trying to sound like a Norwegian. <laughs> um, he's a Norwegian director who often um, creates made up languages. So, um, and, um, did you work with? No, he had commissioned an affiliate work with the so I haven't really seen this. Yeah. So in terms of that issue around sort of language, how do we deal with the language obstacle um, or destroy it entirely? Well, I think there's, I think it's also like a, a cultural difference in theater making. Uh, my experience, when I first came, well, first in England, but then also here, uh, I was kind of struck how important 
the tech, like how important the language is in the American view. Uh, uh, I was not familiar with that. That language seemed to be uh, very, very important. Uh, where in the Netherlands, we don't have any history of playwriting. It is actually really coming just now, I think, from tech. We now have a one school, I think, where you can study playwriting, and that's only 10 years old. So um, there's a lot of work that is not based on language. <laughs> well, and that's a big cultural difference, I think, that we that would be interesting to talk about, um, which is, you know, American theater is largely influenced by British theater, so the playwright is very important. Mm -hmm. um, German theater is mostly about the director, you know, but I just theater. Um, but so, so there's these interesting cultural influences that we, you know, and if we're lucky here at Under Greater, we often get to see a lot of them. And um, what I'd like to do, since we're sort of, um, uh, there's so much that we brought up I want to come back to, but I think it's not, I think we should open it up to, to, to everybody to talk a little bit, and we can hopefully engage some of these other things that come up. Anybody? Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm British, so I'm very happy. <laughs> um, I have a question uh, that relates to whether any of you um, see your work in any way related to uh, what happens out in the streets, like protests that have been uh, going on during New York these few years and in different places and, like, around different causes. Um, so I guess my question is really around how you place the work you do um, in relation to uh, public expression, demonstration, <coughs> at the time that you make work in some other place. Like, there is, but what, what is the interconnection? How do those, how do those things keep pointing? Um, I can say briefly, um, it's, it's certainly something, I know it's on my mind, I know, I'm sure it's on other New Yorkers mind because of the last six months in particular have been particularly tumultuous for us. Um, but even, you know, we live in New York, which is a, a great city for demonstration, and we have Union Square as a sort of resource or platform for us, and you can pass through it any day of the week and there's a gathering of some kind. Um, uh, it, for the record, for our body of work in particular, I always, once we actually do it, we have this like mass of people on stage, and it's like the kind of thing that's like, oh, you need a permit to do this. You know what I mean? Like there's something about the right to assemble a large body of people that always, um, you know, the kind of thing that um, still excites me about creating that work as much as we are doing so. Um, and just to speak back to, um, a uh, particular experience we had with this piece because it, uh, when we just did it in Holland, in Groningen, um, we were working in the, the State Theater, which is like this big historic, um, uh, the, the city theater, which is not something that we have the touched on for as Americans, like we don't have big state funded theaters um, <laughs> that we've gone to as children, you know, we just don't have them. And to have a body of, um, of performers who were coming to be in the show and that they had, they were going into the building that they had been, as children, growing up, going to see this, these shows and feeling that they were always going to be sitting in the seats, but they would never have the opportunity. Like, the idea of even being on the stage to them was ridiculous. It was almost it was so preposterous to them. So when they got the opportunity, I, I, someone explained this to me when we were there and I was like, yeah, whatever. That's not a big deal. And then, uh, actually, when we had people coming in to do the performances and realizing that it actually was a tremendous deal, that it was um, uh, a real emotional and meaningful experience for them to be on the platform, on the podium, um, uh, that it was a bit of a switch of who's being watched and who's watching the sort of uh, democratic hierarchy of that. Um, and I do feel like that's, I feel like the, that all of the artists at the moment should, we do have a duty, I suppose, to be listening to this um, uh, 
climate of protest that's happening right now because it is um, important and it is relevant to what we're doing. I, I don't want to be jumbled up, yeah. but I think it's a great, com yeah. great question, uh, particularly when related to international work yeah. and also international presenting. Coming back, for example, to Roman tragedies, um, when people make that, it was in 2005, I believe. Um, it was very much also a comment from uh, Bush in Iraq, and there was a lot of that around it. So it, it's that quite interesting to see it only, you know, it was 2012 or 11 that it came here so many years later. So how much is still of that vibrant in the room uh, after so many years? I think that's an interesting question that we don't really uh, we don't really talk about a lot because international work sometimes takes years to, to get somewhere. And then uh, the other thing, uh, Jacob here, the, the, the theory from Australia, we were talking yesterday, and this reminds me of it, about uh, your work with Aboriginal, the, the, the Aboriginal work of creating theatre, but then through how it is difficult to translate that through a Western lens. I mean, talk about what's happening in Paris right now, you know, all there's so much going back and forth, but we always still look through our Western lens to that of what is happening. So, yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 I'm just getting to say that. Yeah, there's no, I mean, I don't want to answer you or anything, but it's just something that I think about a lot. And I think it's really interesting for others, creators, what, what do we do with that? But I, I think I want to, because Doug is working on a, on a, trans, a festival, on a translation project, right? Yep. And so one of the things that comes up is that, you know, I, I was just in Poland and at a festival there, and I saw a bunch of work. And the work that I would want to bring here would not be legible. But it would actually tell us so much more about what it's like in Poland right now than the work that is legible. Because there's the work that people make that and I'm thinking about it because it's because it's a classic. I'm not. I can't say his name. Adam Mischa. It's like the, I think it's Miskevich. He's like the most important, you know, writer in Poland. And it's the and the show that I saw was this radical, crazy deconstruction of this epic, epic piece. It's like it's like with like all these weird American like you know, the Joker and it's like this weird and like their sort of radical reimagining of this classic text is very, very relevant. Everyone that was Polish loved it. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. And the one that everybody, all the presenters loved, was the one that looked exactly like everything in Berlin, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, and in Paris and whatever with the video screens and the microphone and everything. <laughs> and um, so, so I'm really curious about that old-fashioned technology of writing and text and language, and how does that, I mean, because we, we come to it, and whether it's otherizing, you know, like, that, there are cultures that don't have written forms, their, their performative forms are not text-based, there are cultures like ours that it is text-based, so how do we think about, you know, and you work so much with Jonas and, and, and places from non-Western places, how does text as a tool and translators working with text as a tool to sort of like, parse the semiotics of different cultures. I'm just curious, what, how do you work with translators and you as a translator? How does that sort of work with each other? I was just wondering if you had seen or how this work in the festival if you found it legible or not in the same way because he has such a specific movement Well, I mean, I'm really fortunate, like, and this is a bigger question, but I'm very fortunate that I was working at, I was curating the Quizzy Festival, and I got exposed to his work with uh, with a whole bunch of people in the room that could tell me what I was looking at. Yeah. You know, and, and so when I finally got to see it at Japan Society, I had all this information, and I think this is a big, I mean, this is a larger question, which is like, what do festivals do to create context for work so it is much more? Yeah. But but I'm but so but I'm I'm more curious at your stage of sort of going out, do you read scripts? Like like how do you engage like if text is sort of like the old fashioned tool in the West to tour work <laughs> where it's like, well we have the script of, you know, Schimmel Fang or whoever and we're gonna you know, and you are gonna produce it with my own actors in my own language. Like that's sort of the oldest fashioned way of touring. 
Um, and, I, and I don't mean that pejoratively. I just mean it. so. So I'm sort of curious. How is that process of like when you pick a show, when you work with an artist or a writer, like how do you think about that? Um, I, I, for me, I would say I think about it differently for every show. It really depends on what the piece is. In the case of Okada, um, I came to it through text rather than first seeing his performance style. Um, and then at a certain point when I knew about his performance style and I knew the team that we had, it was important to me that Dan not feel like he had to recreate Okada. Okada style that um, we were making a new production for here. And so whatever you brought of that that felt um, important and germane for audiences here, that would have been great. But in that particular case, sort of teasing the two apart um, worked really well. With someone like um, <coughs> Schimmel Fennig, uh, Roland Schimmel Fennig is a, is a German writer his work is um, much closer to what we're used to. Um, so there isn't such a leap in terms of what sort of production style you're going to put around it. But um, as a producer, and we normally do start from text, um, it's about really listening to whatever instincts we have first responding to the text. Uh, you really, when you're working with international work, I feel like you really have to know what that instinct is and sort of preserve it because it gets really complicated afterwards. So just know what it is that we responded to because that's the impulse that says, okay, this should be seen in New York. We can make something meaningful in New York. But then also thinking about the team that you put around it. And we've done plays. Uh, there's a play we did about 10 years ago from India called Soccer and Binder by Vijay Tendulkar that needed a very um, realistic production. It was very rooted in village life there and the sort of sexual hierarchies and all sorts of things. And if we had um, tried to bring some other context around it, I think it would have been uh, inscrutable. So in that sense, it was, for that play, it was very important to sort of recreate, as you were saying, you know, this is what's happening over here, but it was, of course, very powerful for people. Whereas with Okada, sort of bringing us and, and that to some common ground um, is pretty scary to do, because you don't really know where you're going, but uh, very exciting. You want to, yeah. No, I, you're right. I mean, I think from a textual base, I think the, the, the translator is sort of the, you know, almost the stepchild or the neglected, you know, <laughs> child in the sense that, that you know, so often, I mean, uh, we, it's not just the text. I mean, it's not just the literal words that you are translating. I mean, there is, they are an artist in their own right that it is literary. That you're not just translating text, but I think it's context and subtext and pretext and all of these things. So there are different entry points, no doubt. So like you're saying, you know, often I have a stack of plays to read, or you're seeing a production, and it's so often that I mean, what we're trying to do, when I, there's a, we're working, everyone's going to be as involved as well. We're bringing, you know, translators and playwrights and dramaturgs and directors from 16 different countries um, to the O'Neill and to the Lark next week. Um, and to have everybody in the same room um, mm -hmm. is, is going to be really exciting. And so we're exploring these ideas of what's the difference between you know, a lone translator in a room who's writing for the page as opposed to thinking about, well, this is now going to have to be spoken by actors. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so the difference between on the page or on the stage. Or, and then also you were talking a lot about the audience. I mean, and then how do you want to relate to the audience that you're presenting this to? How is it going to translate from that? So putting all of that into your head is, I mean, is so daunting. Who do you honor? You have to honor everybody. You have to honor the author, you have to honor the actors, you have to honor the audience. Um, and you, yeah, I mean, <laughs> but that's why, that's why it's so great, I think, or so important also to have a collaborative process in the translation itself. Yeah. Like having actors is 
it is almost, uh, it's, it's so important. I remember translating one of the Dutch pieces, uh, and, and the actors actually picked up on, there were several translations, and one of the things that the actors really picked up on was the rhythm of the text. Mm -hmm. Because of that playwright's typical rhythm, if you just translated the words, you didn't get the rhythm of the text. So, like, I think, but you, if you're just by yourself in your room, Translating it, you might not get that without the input of, of, of that. Well, and with uh, Jonas Kamiri's work, um, he, he's a Swedish writer and his father is from Tunisia, so he sort of brings a particular point of view to writing um, in Sweden. And the first play of his that we produced was called Invasion. And um, we first read it in German because. Linda, our father, who works with us, speaks German, and she got a German translation, and she went to see it over there. Then we got an existing British translation, which allowed me to read it, but uh, just did not feel germane to New York. We ended up um, commissioning a new translation. Jonas' work is um, really slang-based, and um, without a translator who, and, and he wanted the woman who was translating his novel to translate the play. And I thought, no, it's not a theater person. That's a terrible idea. However, um, in that particular instance, um, she was just sort of the way Aya is magically able to um, translate Okada. Uh, Rachel just got his rhythm and his language and was able to create an American version play, um, and we workshop the translation, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do it without him and Rachel and the actors and Eric and the director all sitting together to figure out what is this text for New York. Yeah. It's not, it's much less a process of translation and more of interpretation. Yeah. Something that tries to come to when the, the, you ask um, the audience about, about protests in the street, street activity. Something that's really coming up out of all of, or something that's coming up for me and listening to you all is that the complexity of creating performance and that it doesn't happen in, in isolated pieces and that they're actually sort of creating social sculptures that exist in time and space. And, and it's a very complicated process of negotiating what that series of relationships is that's happening in a room. Um, and uh, I, I, it's not fundamentally different than inviting people to have a protest in a public space. They're just the, the, the set of social relationships that you're asking to provoke and prompt and structure are different. And it's really exciting, I think, to, to hear. Um, and this is why I come back to two things that Dan said as well. Um, one is that like you know who we are at the beginning of a show. And I'm wondering, I, uh, I gonna, uh, you know, is that something that you think about in general at the beginning of a show? or was it specifically this show? And then um, the other question that comes up is, Zero Plus House was um, a break from your normal style, or it was this interesting hybrid, and I think it raised, in its complication, it raised amazing questions. How do you, um, and yet, yeah, so, so I'm just sure, these are like two things, like, <coughs> really, because someone comes out, the, the beginning of the show is very complicated. Um, I don't know, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, tell me, tell me what we do. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> um, I don't really know. I, I guess, I guess, I guess we're talking about, everyone is saying different, what I'm hearing is a lot of really thoughtful, I, I think I know you're, you're asking, I mean, coming on this panel, I was sort of thinking about, yeah, how much of life is a, of life and how much of art making is creating a private language and how much isn't and uh, how much as the artist do you think about your private language and Leonardo was talking about an autobiographical part that doesn't reach any audience mm -hmm. even in Brazil and um, so in a way the questions are, aren't always the same and I guess but I do think of I guess the answer to your first question of I do think that you can divide work into genres of um, 
you, you guys, you know what this is, or you don't know what this is. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and uh, but I don't think there's one that's more valuable than the other. I think, I think that's a sort of a technology. Mm -hmm. And you start there, you know? I mean, certainly if the greatest compliment for any of our work is when someone says, oh, what I like about your work is you teach us the language at the beginning. And then by the end, the end we're, we're there, you know? And, and I guess I feel like, I guess I, I guess I feel that the only sort of pitfall when you start working with um, translations, people from other countries, people who, it becomes its own kind of piousness. Mm -hmm. And that then you, uh, so as long as you're trying hard, uh, kicking yourself in the butt to not be so respectful, um, for a sort of political and a personal reason, um, then you can deal with that. You know, I mean, I think that for all of the effort that I make in the Okada collaborations that I've done to say this is you, this is you, uh, it's almost like a neurological experiment with like optical illusions. Like there were there were some um, movements that I created totally having only seen like an hour of Okada work, totally from my own movement background that were, but they were specifically not resolving, they were not legible. And they would go onto the brains of the American audience and people would say, how did you make that movement so Japanese? And I would say, I really tried not to make it Japanese at all. And I just don't know if when you add into the viewer the information that is Japanese and then you see something that isn't resolving, your brain is made to categorize and just goes, that's, I know that, that's Japanese, because I know it's Japanese and I know that I don't know what it is. So I guess I wonder, as you do the dance between opacity and, hey, you know what's going on. I mean, I guess in a way, uh, something that Okada and I do share is, is an interest in Brett. And I guess for me, one critic long ago like me turned me on to an idea about Brecht and his anti-melodramatic thrust of saying that when you go to an audience and you say, you shouldn't sit and go, I know exactly what that is. That's so sad. Because then you're done with your political action. Mm -hmm. And then you should go and say, like, that's not what that is. I can't be like that. I don't know what that is. I reject that. And then that would provoke political action. And um, my strategy for that means a lot, and a lot pulling from my research in clown is to like look at the audience and be like, hey, you know, you know what it is, very much what Leonardo said about our interactions. Mm -hmm. Like if I look at the audience and not and go, you know, you know, I can tell them anything. I can say, you know how we all commit genocide. And they're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess to me that's sort of a fundamental Brechtian move where then the audience should go, uh oh. I just not alone on that. Um, so I guess that's sort of what I what I think about that. And I guess I, I don't know that uh, yeah, I don't know that it could never be totally overcome whether whether or not a play can make people think those people are just like me or, or not. You know, I don't know where that how that happens. How or, that transaction happens. Or maybe it doesn't have to happen. Maybe yeah. it's like you're sort of saying like the question has to keep going on. So we're we're pretty tight. Any more, more. Yeah. Just something I thought I think was a lead in the conversation happening tomorrow, which is that when you talk about adaptation and you're talking about translation, you're also talking about performance language, which is what you've been talking about. And so um, as we think about theater and performance coming forward, how your work is creating perhaps new performance languages and new performance styles that are becoming part of the landscape. And so anyway, I thought that was a cool bridge to Questions, questions, answers, insights, startling moments of revelation. All right, well, I think um, we could keep this, I know I could keep this conversation going with these guys for like a couple more hours, but I think um, we should wrap now. And um, do we have, can we keep people hang here and chat for a little while? Yeah. So why don't we just do that? Um, I, I also really have to pee. <laughs> so so um, if you guys can stay and hang out and talk for a little while, we'll sort of do that. And then, um, yeah, come back tomorrow. We're going to do another uh, conversation that's going to be about acting. Um, and I, I actually, now that listening to sort of this idea of collaborative translation, 
movement gestures on fish and all the things that happen with performers on stage, I think, were going to have a fun. Oh, sure.